Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. Don't use the DB context in interactive Blazor components even if you saw this for instance during a presentation in the .NET Com. If you do this you will hate yourself sooner rather than later because you will enter a hell of different exceptions that you don't know exactly how to solve and even why they actually are thrown. However, worry not because in this video I want to explain you and show you exactly why it is bad to use the DB context directly in Blazor interactive component. And before we get started, one thing is important, it's not about only using the DB context in the component directly, but even if you use mediator for instance, or if you use services, but you use the regular DB context in the mediator handler or in the service, you still have the same problems. So moving the DB context outside of the component doesn't really help. So let's first of all take a look into a very practical setup here in my demo application to understand exactly where the big problem actually lies. So here I have a class that I called very simple dummy service. Now the main responsibility of this class is to generate me on each instantiation of a new object a new identifier. If we move over to our Blazor components you will see that I have created here a routable component which is this dummy which we find under this link. And this dummy component just uses other two components which is dummy1 and dummy2. Now if we take a look at dummy1 we see that we inject the dummy service. Once again we expect that each time we get a new service injected we will get a new identifier in that specific service. And we just read the identifier and display it. And the exactly same thing we do also in dummy2. I will pay attention to a very important detail here. In both of these components, dummy1 and dummy2, we use render mode interactive server. And that's actually a very important thing. So now I'm about to run the application and what I would or what most of us would expect when we run the application is that when we navigate to this component, to this dummy component, which is the root component for everything, is that we would get, for instance, to see an identifier, a GUID for dummy1 and another GUID for dummy2. So let's run the application. So here's the running application and I also have the dev to tools open and I am on the WebSocket step because this is what is interesting me. Now the thing is that right now I am here on this home page. Now if we go on dummy, what we'll see is that we have created or there was a WebSockets connection created and in fact you see that it has kind of like an identifier. And this is because what happened is that when we render this interactive server components, we have the regular WebSockets connection that we had previously in Blazor server. And this means that behind the scenes we have something that is called a circuit. And in this circuit or while the circuit is open, basically what happens is that everything that is scoped or all scoped services are basically scoped to that circuit itself. Let me show you what I mean by that. So if you take a look here at the identifiers, you'll see that the identifier in dummy1 is exactly the same as the identifier in dummy2. So if these components wouldn't be rendered by the server with interactor, interactive server rendering, we would have different identifiers. But still, here we have exactly the same identifier. So you would say maybe this is not that a big of, of a problem because here we are just in a one component and for instance if we navigate back to the home and if we wait just for a few seconds and go back for the dummy we see that another circuit is established and yeah we still have this bug because the identifier is exactly the same in both of them but still we are in a different circuit so that circuit didn't live that long. However let's tune it up a bit. Let's go for instance to the counter component and let's also add here for instance this dummy2 component which is exactly the same. So let's use the hot reload and let's go back to the browser. Let's maybe go on home and let's just do a refresh so that we get everything from scratch. Now once again here we get these two WebSockets connections but these two WebSockets connections they don't have anything to do with the circuit itself. However the thing is when we go on the counter we see that this WebSockets connection was opened and we have this identifier here. Now if we go right now on dummy, we see that the behavior is differently. We keep exactly the same WebSockets connection open. So there is no new WebSockets connection and indeed the identifier is exactly the same that we had also on the counter. And we can play around here, go back to the counter and we see that it's exactly the same identifier, go back here no new WebSockets connection will be established which means that the circuit that has this identifier still lives on. And theoretically me as a user as long as I am just navigating for instance through these two basically what it happens is that 
this WebSocket connection will be open, the circuit will be open, and therefore all scoped services that are resolved in, in, in the circuit will always return the same instance for as long as this connection is open. And let me show you how this is different from a regular SSR component in the new Blazor. So here, for instance, I have this new component, which is the right dummy. And the only difference between the right dummy and dummy one and dummy two is actually that we don't use interactive server rendering. Now let's go for instance on this home component, which is by default not rendered interactively by the server. And let me add to this component dummy two and this the right dummy. Let me just also delete this because I don't need that and just save, click hold, reload, and then move back to the browser. Let's also once again go here and home just to a refresh so that we get everything from starting. Cool. So now on the home page, since we also added dummy 2, you see that this WebSockets connection was already created with this specific identifier. However, if you take a look here in the right dummy, you see that the identifier is different than the identifier that we have here previously. And this thing actually continues, for instance, if we go to the counter, we see that the WebSockets connection is exactly the same. So we have exactly the same circuit. And therefore, the value for the identifier in dummy2 is exactly the same. But if we navigate back to the home, we see that here we have a different value in the right dummy because this is fully server-side rendered. But for the component that is interactively rendered by the server and still working on the same circuit, we have the old value that we had previously. And this can cause a lot of problems because as you can see, I can spend maybe one hour as a user in an application just navigating through these three tabs and I will have only one circuit that will handle everything. Now, let me briefly explain at this blackboard why this is actually a problem for Entity Framework Core. So let's imagine that right now a new component is rendered on the browser and this component is a component that is marked with interactive server rendering. So let's call this C1. Now let's assume that in this C1, or by the time this C1 needs to be rendered, what it will happen is that there will be a WebSockets connection created. And for instance, let's change here the color and let's name this WebSocket connection something like this because we don't know all the identifier. Now the thing is that this component, for instance, maybe just needs an entity framework or needs a DB context instance. So what it happens is that obviously we have the DI container. And let's make this DI container very big here. And let's also change the color so that we know that is something different. And let's call it DI. Now, the idea is that right now, basically what the DI does, it creates a scope. Let me maybe rename this to scope. So it creates a scope and the scope basically will be lived or will live as long as this WebSockets connection is also still available. So this means that if this component actually needs, for instance, the instance of the DB context, what it will happen is that it will create an instance of the DB context because it doesn't exist. And uh, let's just call this context. And uh, yeah, just let's move it here around and maybe also change the color so that we know that it is something different. Now, if the component needs this instance, basically this is a reference type because it's just a class. So the DI container, we say, hey, but I already have a scope for this specific circuit. So uh, here is the object that's already here. So you can use it and it just passes the reference. So this component uses this specific instance of the DB context. Now let's assume that we have another component, a new component, and we can name this component, for instance, C2. This component also maybe needs to work with the DB context. So it would rely on the DI container to receive an instance of the DB context. Now the DI container will say exactly the same thing. Hey, we have already a scope for the circuit to which you actually belong, and we have an instance of the DB context, so just use it. And then at a later point, maybe, I don't know, this component goes away, but maybe another component will just spawn up, for instance, uh, C3. And in this case, once again, this component maybe needs Entity Framework Core or the DB context. And the DI container will once again say, hey, we already have an object, you belong to the same scope, so just use this object. So also C3, C3 will use the object. And in the example that we had previously, and I said that as a user, I can basically, maybe if my use cases or my business use case is like that, I can just navigate through components that are all, all of them interactively rendered by the server. So in that case, 
I will have for one hour, for instance, if I use the application for run out one hour, I will have for one hour, one instance of the DP context and all components will use the same instance. Now, what will happen is that if these components actually are not used anymore, like this component is not used anymore, this component is not used anymore, only in that point, at, at that point, the circuit is also deleted and at that point, also this instance of the DB context is also deleted from the DI container. Now, what's actually the problem with Entity Framework so that we have a DB context that could live even one hour or even more and be in, in this time reused by a lot of different components? Now, if you take a look at the EF core documentation on or on different expert blogs, you will see that everybody, literally everybody says that your DB context should be as short lived as possible, not one hour, less than one second means this. Now, the problem is that if your DB context is not short lived, you will have a lot of different exceptions down the way. You will have exceptions, for instance, about concurrency. You will have exceptions that say, for instance, that a certain entity is already tracked. And it would be a help for you to, to understand it. Say, okay, but why is this entity tracked? Because it's just right now that I have actually retrieved it from, from the database. But in reality, that entity might have been retrieved from the database 30 minutes ago, and you're just still reusing that. So that's the problem with having a long-lived DB context. And that's the problem why using the DB context directly in these components that are interactively rendered by the server is very bad. It will cause you a lot of different headaches. And once again, remember what we did at the Blackboard. The DB context instance, if you are in the scope of a circuit, is already there in the DI container. So no matter if you use mediator handlers, no matter if you use services that you inject in components, as long as you are bound to a circuit, you will always receive the same instance. So mediator or using services doesn't help at all here. Now, the only thing that helps is not using the DB context directly, but using DB context factory. To set up DB context factory, I come here back to our program.cs file and where I would add the entity framework DB context, what I add instead is use this method add DB context factory. And this would allow me to inject in my components a DB context factory and create a new instance of the DB context just in time when I need it to do something with the database and make sure that I dispose it immediately afterwards. So let's move to this dummy one component to see exactly how that would be implemented. First of all, I would need a using here for Microsoft Entity Framework Core. And then I would inject this IDB context factory of AppDB context. Now let's imagine that in this own initialized method, I want to perform some logic, some operations that also involve the database. So what I'll do here is I'll replace this own initialized with the own initialized async. The initial line will remain exactly the same because I just want to pass the identifier to my field so that it can be displayed there. But now comes the important part. Let's say that in this moment, I need to perform an operation with the database. So what I will do here is I will say here using var context equals await app con app db context factory create db context. And just in this instance, only an instance of the db content will be created for me. And more than that, I have wrapped it into a using, and this means that when I don't use this context anymore, it will be disposed at the next possible garbage collection. So what I can do here, for instance, let's have a placeholder. Here is where you would perform your database operations. And possibly at the end, we will have to finish with this await context save changes async. And virtually after the execution of the code exits this line 20, in the next possible opportunity, the instance of the DP context will be disposed. So this is how we can make sure that we have short lived DB context when we work with components that are rendered interactively by the server. And this will save you a lot of headaches and a lot of troubleshooting and days and days of debugging. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and also share it with your colleagues, with your friends or with whoever you think that might find this information here useful. And if you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and I would be very, very thankful to you for that. And if you have any question or just want to get in touch with me or get a discussion started, don't be shy and head over to the comment section and just leave a comment and I would be more than happy to get in touch with you. This being said, thank you very much for watching and until the next time, I wish you the very best.